So, um, in fact, I'm not just telling you about this result. I'm telling you about everything about uh, distributed computing, assuming you know nothing. And um, <laughs> not only do you know nothing, but you don't even want to know about it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is a lot of this work is joint work with Jared. Sayer. I mean, the main result is joint work with Jared Sayer. And all of it, all the, anything else I mentioned that I did in this area is also joint work with Jared Sayer and other people. Um, so it starts, the story always starts with, um, actually it was the Albanian general's problem, but he changed the name after people from Albania, people complained that it's a real country. He said, imagine, we imagine that there are several divisions of the Byzantine army they are camped outside an enemy city, each division commanded by its own general. The generals can communicate with one another only by messages. Uh, after, so uh, after observing the enemy, they must decide upon a, a common plan of action. However, some of the generals may be traitors trying to prevent the loyal generals from reaching agreement. And that begins the story of Byzantine agreement. Um, and luckily, just recently, it was announced that Leslie Lampert won the Turing Award. So, uh, and partly it's, this is mentioned as one of his contributions. And the point was to model um, faulty computation in a distributed system. Okay, so what is Byzantine agreement? We have n process. So I know that it's all new to you. If you have any questions, please, of course. No, I know you'll ask me. So. We have n processors. Um, each processor has an initial bit. And the goal is to output the same bit. Um, if, uh, if all the initial bits are 0, you have to output a 0. If they're 1, you have to output a 1. So the natural thing maybe would be to take a majority and output that. OK, but we have an adversary. And the adversary is controlling the red processors. So the adversary controls, in, in, for the purpose of this talk, we'll assume the adversary is controlling a constant fraction of processors who sometimes I'll call them bad and the others good. Okay, and the adversary is adaptive, meaning that it can choose these as the algorithm is running, which matters if the algorithm is using random bits, versus static, where the adversary can't chooses them at the start, independent of the random bits. Okay, and it's full, full information, meaning that the adversary knows the state of all the processors. So in other words, during the course of the algorithm, the processes might flip bits. It doesn't know in, in, in advance what those bits are going to be, but otherwise it knows the state of the processes. Um, and other possibilities are private channels. Now, what does it mean that there's full information? It means the adversary has full information. But if A is sending a message to B, C doesn't, and C's good, C doesn't know what A sent to B. In private channels, the adversary doesn't see what A is sending to B. Or you could assume some kind of crypt cryptographic limitations on the adversary so that the messages are encrypted and the adversary doesn't have enough resources to decrypt it. That's an, another common assumption. Okay, so what about communications? For the purposes of this, all to all. So in other words, anyone can send a message to anyone else. And uh, it's a message passing model, meaning communication is by A sending to B. When A sends to B, only B receives that message, and B knows that A sent it. OK, now there's another common model now, shared memory. It's different. It's not message point-to-point -point communication. I'm not going to go into it, but it's, it's different. And um, also, the adversary schedules the message delivery. So we're assuming asynchronous, where the, av the adversary controls the timing of the message delivery. OK, now, the delays are of unknown length. But all messages are eventually delivered if they're sent by a good processor. If A sends to B, B will eventually receive A. But B doesn't know when to call it quits and decide that A is bad and is really not sending a message. Yeah? Uh, if uh, A sends uh, two messages to B, can that vessel switch the order? Yeah, yeah. OK, so there are other possibilities. You could have synchronous, in which case communication proceeds in rounds. So everyone sends a message. All the messages are received that round. OK, and a broadcast model, which uh, we'll talk about in a second. Synchronous, of course, if the bad guy is sending, 
in the synchronous model, he can send some messages to some of the processors, but not to others. Okay, so we're talking about the asynchronous model. Now what that causes is that you can't wait to hear from, if there are T bad guys, and T is what we're going to use for the number of bad guys, you can't wait to hear from more than N minus T processors because the T processors might not even be sending. So if you're waiting around, um, if you have to take another action in order to make the algorithm move forward, you can't wait. Okay, so, um, and processors may know about different subsets of inputs when voting. So there's a lot of reasons why just voting won't work. Um, now, in the asynchronous model, you might ask how you measure time. And one way to describe it is the length of the longest chain of messages. So like A sends to B, and then C is waiting to hear from B after B received A. So there's a chain of messages, and you can measure time by that. Another way to think about it is the longest delay of a message is one unit. And if you add up the units, that, that would be the time. Yep. No, no, just a common bit. A common bit. And in case they don't have a common bit? No, no. No, so you have a one, I have a zero, you know, it's spread around. At the end of our protocol, our algorithm, uh, we all decide on a bit, and that bit should be the same bit. So it either is a one or a zero, plus it has to be the case that if we started over the ones, we output a one. If we started with zeros, we output a zero. Yes? No. Not. Well, yeah, both to, to, in other words, either cause us to fail or cause us to, to not, uh, to take a long time if we, if he can't cause us to fail. Right. So. So you're right. There has to be a sort of time when they do it. If you're following a protocol, usually the t I'm going to show you a protocol. Basically, it has to be the case that you're waiting for some event to happen, and then you take a step. So initially, everyone starts. But then after that, there's no way to measure time other than waiting for something to happen and then taking a step. Why yeah. Does, and, and why doesn't majority work? Why doesn't it work? No. Well, I mean, right away, say the bad guys can tell some people that they have a one. Say everyone, ha maybe there's half ones, half zeros. Okay. But the bad guy tells everyone he has a one, uh, say half the people he has a one, and he tells half the people he has a zero. Now the people have, some people think there's a majority of zero, and some people think there's a, that's only one reason why it doesn't work. And that's the, that's sort of the easiest reason to see it doesn't work. Okay. Um, all right, now we come to 1982 with the celebrated, it's always called the celebrated impossibility, or the famous impossibility result by Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson that shows that one crash fault prevents any deterministic algorithm from working. Okay, so what's a crash fault? That's just when, you know, forget bad behavior. Forget that the processors are controlled by bad guys who can do, say anything they want. If a pro one processor during the course of the algorithm can um, stop, after it sends some messages to some processors and not to others, and then it dies. So it's working well. It's working according to a protocol that you design, but it stops in the middle of sending messages. Then you can, then there's a not that hard proof to show that it's impossible if the algorithm is deterministic. Okay, and then was, she won the Knuth Prize for this uh, achievement, which is called the fundamental in all of computer science. Um, result. So, kind of interesting. Okay, so what happened after that? Well, first of all, um, I promised to show you what does an asynchronous distributed algorithm look like. Okay, so it describes what a good, an individual good processor would do because the only, it's, you're seeing everything from the, your point of view, and so you need to say, you need to describe what this good processor should do. Uh, initially, it starts with its bit x. And then typically, you can label your messages with round, round numbers. Now, there's no such thing as a round, but you can kind of keep track of rounds according to your protocol, according to what you know. So you can do that. There's no reason why you can't. So you can sort of simulate rounds. So I'm going to show you Ben Orr's algorithm. 
So this is not long after the impossibility result when it was realized that you might want to use randomization to get around this. Okay, so. I'm going to talk about everything. I'm going to talk about everything. But I want to describe asynchronous. I want to describe asynchronous because, um, because that's what I'm going to be talking about. So I want you to get a feel for asynchronicity. Um, it's not. OK, so as far as I know, the only synchronous algorithm takes t plus 1 steps, where t is the number of bad guys. It's deterministic. And as far as I know, there's no randomized algorithm that uses less unless it's unless under certain conditions which are compromised, which I, I will actually say something about this. OK, so. So, the, so my only comment was not yeah. about number of rounds, but uh, I think the, you talked about the rounds from the individual standpoint of the, yeah. of the processor. Right. It is a synchronous protocol anybody could imagine that after every event, I send everything I know. So I send right. my people, right. everybody right. I send, I get right. something. Right, more, right. Tell everybody. This is the most general protocol that you can have. Right. And uh, it doesn't work. But by by it's a little part of that. Right, right, right. Yeah, so just to be for a randomized protocol. So yeah, deterministic won't, won't work. Deterministic. But it will work for synchronized. I, I didn't, well, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have it. Uh, I can't just like throw up the synchronous algorithm for you um, because I haven't looked at it <laughs> in a long time. OK, so. But Benoit's algorithm is very simple. It's, this is it. OK, so this is Benoit's asynchronous algorithm. OK, and it works if t is less than n over 5. OK, now I'm going to describe it to you. However, if you're confused, that's OK. I'm going to go through it in detail. OK, so while you're not decided, you're going to do these steps. OK, so remember, it's from the point of view of the individual processor. You're going to send your bit to everybody. And then you're going to wait to receive bits from n minus t. Remember, that's all you can wait for. If more than n plus t over 2 agree on the bit, on a bit, on a, some bit v, then you're going to send this message, echo v, to all others. Otherwise, having received these messages, you're going to send echo question mark to all. OK, <coughs> now you're going to wait till you get some echo star message, star meaning anything, received from n minus t people. And if the number of messages of the form echo with the same bit v exceeds n plus t divided by 2, then you're going to decide v. That's the decide case. If it exceeds t, but not this, then you're going to set your bit to the v in, this, in these messages. And you're going to maintain that v, but you're not going to decide it. Finally, otherwise, if you have too few of these messages agreeing on a bit, you're going to set your bit to a private coin flip. So you're allowed, this is a randomized algorithm. You're allowed, each processor is allowed to do a randomized coin flip. OK, so I'm going to explain this thing. Um, so here, as I said, you can't wait any longer. You can only wait for n minus t messages. Um, if you've received this many, it means that the majority of good processors agree on this bit. So in other words, you can't have two such messages. Uh, two different bits, two different values for v. OK. Um, all right. Now. You went too into my opinion. No, you can't possibly absorb it, but I'm not finished. I'm not finished. I just, I'm still explaining it. OK. So I know I don't have two boards. If I had a picture, that the algorithm would still be up there. So you have to sort of, but I'm going through it again, OK. All right, I'm, I'm even going to go through it again and again, OK? All right, so there's two points, as I mentioned. When you have a lot of these echoes all agreeing on the same bit, that's your deciding point. OK, now, now there's another threshold, which is the maintaining point. And that means that there's only one value possible for that maintaining point, because you needed a majority of the good processes to agree on a bit. OK, so that. And it's not hard to show that's a maintaining point. Because if you receive greater than t echoes, at least one good process with the same bit, at least one good processor sent it. That means that that good processor received more than n plus t over 2, which means that uh, votes for that value v, 
which means that a majority of good processors had V. Okay, that means there's only one possible vote like that. There can't be another one. Yeah, it doesn't mean that, I'm just saying if there is something like this, yeah. Okay, now, what happens if you decide? Okay, sorry, I just want to make the case that there's two thresholds, and either all the processes are in these two cases, or they're in these two cases. Okay, so if there is a processor in this case, then all the other processors must be in this case. Okay, why is that? Because suppose one processor gets to the deciding point. That means that he received, or she, or it, it received n plus t over 2. And by the way t is, n over 5, because of the way the numbers work out, that's bigger than 3t plus 1. Okay, it received 3t plus 1 echoes, which means that they came from 2t plus 1 good processors, which wrote to the other processors, which wrote to all the processors, which means that at least since at least t plus 1 of those good processors' messages were received by everybody, which means that they're all in the maintaining state. Okay, so if everybody's in the maintaining state and everyone's in the deciding state, in the next round everyone has the same bit, and you can see, it's not hard to see, that there'll be a decision in the next round. Okay. So, this is a very important algorithm to me and other people. Um, it shows two things. One thing that it shows, I think, is that reasoning about asynchrony is very difficult. I mean, it's a pain. Nobody wants to do it unless they're in this field. Um, and two, um, Oh, and by the way, along, along with this, there have been a couple of serious mistakes in distributed computing. I just went to the lecture by, um, what's his name, Vladimir Vovatsky, and he talked about the mistakes in mathematics in his field. There was a mistake from 1990 that was used for 18 years before the mistake was found, and there are other mistakes too. So it's tricky to reason about this stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, sorry. I actually, oh. I'm going to talk about it right now. So, oh, okay. so you're saying, oh, sorry, let me just hear your question again. Okay, so in the next step, when we do good feature of finding corner symmetry, I mean, we'd like to do it as well in my implementation value of uh, this. Okay, so let's look at this. Okay, so what happens? Here we are, the, yeah, these are the last steps. Okay, so what happened is, so, if you think about how the algorithm works, there's some bunch of steps above. And then we come to this place where you're looking at these cases <coughs> about uh, the number of echoes. And over here, if there aren't very many, you're going you're gonna to toss a private coin. Now, this algorithm will work when everybody tosses the same value for their private coin. And, and it matches the one that people are maintaining. OK, so either. Processes are in the bottom two states. So that either, so in the case where somebody is tossing a private coin, everyone else is either maintaining a value but not deciding or tossing a coin too. Okay, so when it happens that this private coin flip matches this value, the next round everybody will decide. And that happens exponentially, <coughs> can take exponentially many steps for everyone to toss the same coin, almost everyone to toss the same coin. And it has to agree with this value. And the adversary has some leeway in setting this value before this happens. So this is determined from the previous round. And then everyone tosses a coin. OK. So what does this mean? It means that a number of people observe that this coin toss doesn't really have to be. You could possibly replace this this private coin toss by some kind of distributed coin toss if you were able to create a protocol that would produce a global coin flip. Now, it doesn't have to be a real, it has to be a kind of pseudo global coin flip. What does it have to do? It only has to work with, say, constant probability to give you, I'm yes. Sorry, yeah, that doesn't answer your question.
We, who's we? Who's we? Who's we flipping it? Oh, so I'm going to flip it, but I'm bad. I mean, so, um, so I'm bad, so maybe you won't hear from me, or maybe I'll flip something that always disagrees with the one that's being maintained. Then there'll be no, what? No, no, but no, no. But what you're saying is, what? What if I? What if one processor flips a coin? Why can't everyone use that coin? No, no, no. I, no. no I'm asking. Uh, the compiler takes the last step. Yeah. Step, step uh, Z C to be the negation of V. That's all. Oh well, that that would be really bad what? because half the people could be maintaining at V, and then half the people are going to be having maintaining at zero. Now what? Everyone's flipping. Half the people are flipping to zero. You're saying, and this guy, and half the population's maintaining at one, so they're not going to agree. Okay, but then in the next round, nothing. They're half and half. Nothing. You know, oh, nothing. Okay. okay. So we're going to avoid to the we want to get to where you have almost everyone, all the good guys in agreement. Are you saying that the going through the Yes. And then if you vast majority, if you have all the good processors agree. In fact, that's another thing to observe. It doesn't have to be all the good processors. It just has to be uh, four fifths n good processors. So if you reduce the resilience, you still you don't need all the good processors agreeing. You just need four fifths n. Okay. It doesn't matter that there's some good processors not agreeing. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. You mean what is the goal of the algorithm? No, I'm just asking whether Nobody, there's not going to be agreement. If there's not a vast number, we don't know if there's not a vast number. If there's not four fifths n, that doesn't seem so vast to me. If there's not four fifths n agreeing, then it could be that they'll have different values. They won't agree on the same value. In other words, we want everyone to agree on the same value. It's okay, but okay. So if everyone has different values, it's okay to output either a zero or a one. Right. But the point is to get agreement. Yeah. What? So, so you can flip. If everyone got either a zero or a one, yeah, you're, you're right. You're totally right. So you're saying yes, exactly. That's exactly right. If you start the algorithm with everyone having a zero, everyone will decide a zero. Yeah. Because. It's possible that you want to prevent the case where um, okay, wait a second. Let me just think about this. Okay, so if you everyone gets zero. Oh, you won't. Because what about the ones that are maintaining? This one's maintaining. It's got to agree with the one that's that, so what will happen is the adversary will make sure that some people think it's a one. OK, so that won't work either. So just uh, summarize the yeah. last step. Yeah. The algorithm has presented in the beginning. You know, it's an observation about this algorithm. Uh, right. Even before we get anywhere down, that if more than 80% agree in the initial pitch, that's then right. they will decide. They'll decide uh, right uh, away. They right away. They'll never get to any of this stuff. Yeah. They'll all decide right away. Yeah. Yeah, everybody will decide. That's right. OK, so we need four fifths agreement. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. OK, so everyone starts to focus, I mean, the community starts to focus on this global coin flip. How can we achieve a global coin flip other than everybody flipping their private bit and hoping it all comes out the same? It doesn't have to be a global coin flip every time. It just once in a while we want to see Somewhat fair global coin flip. OK, so that's the goal. That's the goal. And it doesn't even matter if sometimes they flip different values, that the global coin flip isn't even collective. It's not even shared, not let alone that it has the right value. Uh, is it uh, will a better uh, global coin flip also take care of the other side, that they can always hide the markdown? 
This was improved to um, two thirds n. I just didn't put it very, with only a few extra steps. I, I mean, not a few. I just didn't, wanted to make it simple for you. Uh, I, uh, I mean, as a, uh, I mean, I just want to know, can you see theoretically the node cannot go below n over three? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, we do. By, um, by the first result for that was a paper that doesn't appear anywhere. And I'll tell you about that, too. <laughs> They, uh, they didn't do for randomized. They didn't do for randomized. It's, it's due to Carlin and Yao and try finding that paper. I found, I found it because someone gave it to me. And I don't have it with me. And it's, half of it's wrong and crossed out. So it's an interesting, interesting, interesting paper. I shouldn't put this on the, oh, sorry, I shouldn't put this online. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah, if, well, if you, if this is very high for everybody, it's a start that you decide right away. I mean, the only question is. So question marks are the other high. possibility. Yeah. Question marks are the other possibility. Or, or different values, different, a different value. Yeah, but if I got the. Uh, oh, the no, you wouldn't send, the, you wouldn't send a different value. A good guy wouldn't send, but a bad guy could send a different value and then. You wouldn't, and say you don't, you have question marks, you could have question marks, you could have bad values, you could have good values, bad values sent by the bad processor. If they don't add up to the right number, then you go down yeah, here. Well, what I'm saying is yeah. that uh, if I got n minus k next step, and it means I got at least n minus k, n minus two k next step from good guys. Right. Then uh, if no one sends a question mark, then, uh, then one bit must yes, be. Yes, yes. If everyone, Sent the, a bit, it's the same bit, and you have enough. That's right. So, so the only case that uh, even if no, even if they didn't send the same bit, uh, just that uh, if uh, uh, if there are no question marks, there is some bit that is uh, above k. If you go back to this algorithm, you see, the only way you'd send an echo with a bit is if a majority of the good guys agree on that bit. Yeah. So you can never have two bits, different bits sent by good processes. Of course. I okay. Mean, not, not that the same processor sent the same. Uh, no, no, I mean oh, two different okay. processors. Two different good processors are not going to send two different bits oh, okay. in the echo stage. Oh, okay. Okay, but bad guys might. All right. So. It suffices to generate a sequence of bits such that four-fifths of the processors agree on the bit, and one of these bits, uh, they agree on one of these bits, and with some bounded probability, it's one or zero. It's a, a basically a fair coin. Okay, that suffices. Okay, so for example, ben, in the first paper, Benoit observed that if T was... So uh, Benoit observed that if t is really small, like square root n, then this works in constant expected time because the adversary can only affect square root n bits. And with you know reasonable constant probability, the number, the variance, I mean, it has a variance of square root n. Or, so with constant probability, the number of ones will exceed the number of zeros by square root n. And so whatever the adversary does, it won't affect the uh, outcome. So um, so you'll have a, a, some kind of coin flip now and then. Sorry, yeah. No, you don't need to know anything. Suppose that it is a fair coin flip. So then you're applying it to this algorithm. No, this, so this is just a, this is if you're running the coin flip algorithm, and it, oh, you need to have. Uh, you need to know that the majority of the working for you have to explain that. Well, I'm, I'm not, okay, let me just think. So you're running this thing, and you get that 
you get that there's a majority of, I guess you need, you might need a bigger majority. No, what do you need? If you just take a vote, oh, I see. You could do this. It won't work if t is bigger. That's all. But if you do this, if you assume that t is square root n, and you take majority, then it will work. Right. Yeah. Uh, I saw a point to it that the postdoc job goes back to the initial state of something. It's, it's just repeated over and over again. Yeah, so it's not the echo. So it, I mean, it goes back to Yeah, it goes back to the start. It goes back to the start. Yeah, you send out your bit, the whole thing. It goes you allowed, did you allow the adversary to pick the order of matrices? Yeah. So he's sending, I guess the message will say, I, I Yeah, the messages all have numbers, yeah. and you know what round yeah, you're in. So you can, yeah. so there is an issue of whether he could have used the, yeah. to mix things up totally, but you can prevent that from happening with round numbers, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> okay, so let me, yes. Right, right. If you have Byzantine agreement, do you get a good coin flip? Oh, uh, uh, there is something like that. Yeah, there is. There are lower bounds, which basically reduce the problem to some kind of flipping of the coin. But I'm not an expert on the lower bounds. So I'm not prepared to demonstrate that to you. But yes, it's a relationship. That's how you prove the lower bounds. Okay, so it is required. Some sense. Not quite. Not quite. It's not quite the complexity of flipping a coin, but it's, it's uh, around that. OK, now there are thousands of papers on this subject. And no one, I'm sure no one is an expert, least of all me. Um, but I, and these are all the different dimensions. And I'm going to discuss a lot of them. Um, one thing is the rushing adversary. That's, uh, maybe I'll get there. Um, no, well, yeah, I'll get there. Um, and then there's like quantum. And you can talk about sparse networks. And um, what else? So basically, a lot of the research went into the computational bounded adversary, into cryptography in the 80s and 90s. And um, we, I started to look at time, um, sorry, uh, bit complexity of some of these algorithms. And um, also, some related problems came up. OK, just to, I don't know why I have this slide. Just it's kind of strange for some of the papers. OK. So the simplest model was proposed by, uh, I guess, maybe proposed by, uh, well, the simplest model is the broadcast model. In the broadcast model, there's an adversary, at least the way, there's a static version of the broadcast model, where the adversary chooses t lo So you have an array. The and this is a one-round broadcast model. This is the simplest thing you can ask. The adversary chooses t locations. And then there are n minus t locations written by other good processors. The adversary sees their output, and then it chooses its bits. OK. Yeah, each processor has a square. It writes to the square. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, each processor has a square, like processor i writes to square i. And the adversary has already reserved some locations. It writes to those locations after it sees the output of the other people. OK, so this is clearly easy. It's an easy model to do this problem because everyone sees all the input. If you see all the input, you'll all arrive at the same answer. And you can tell if it all has zeros or all has ones. <coughs> and you agree on a threshold. So this is just trivial, trivial. OK, but why are we talking about it? Because in 1985, Ben Orr and Lineal wrote a, uh, a very influential paper called Collective Coin Flipping, which is really worth reading for anybody. It's, um, it's the question of, in this model, can we do a coin flip? OK, so, it's, um, so in other words, the adversary, the, bad, the good guys in, in their particular model, the good guys will always flip a fair coin and write it down in their spots. And the adversary will see the random bits and then choose its bits. And then they ask all sorts of interesting questions about this. Uh, so for example, can we get that the probability that the function, is there an f? Is there a function f, which when it looks at this array, will output a 0 with probability a half? 
if t, the number of bad guys, is bigger than square root n? And they say yes if t is equal to point n to the point 6, 3. Only in the case where the adversary is static, meaning, meaning that it selects its locations ahead of time before seeing the random bits. Okay, if the adversary has the additional power of picking the locations, then they can't do better than square root n. Uh, they have epsilon, and they have a trade-off with epsilon. There's an epsilon in front of this thing. Okay. And, yeah? When the bad guys pick the locations they want to go to, they're clobbering the good guys. I mean, the idea is that they're, I mean, I don't, I'm not exactly sure why. It matters? It matters where they are. Because their function, their function isn't like symmetric. It depends on um, locations. Yeah, location. So the adversary can use that to their advantage. Uh, and, well, also, no, the bits will determine which locations are more important, too. And so the adversary can look at the bits and decide which, which bits are really important, and he could take those over if he's able to look at the bits first. I guess that's the real issue. All right, so, however, they, there's a question of doing this in multiple rounds in this broadcast model. And so uh, one problem that people looked at is, well, so we have uh, Russell and Zuckerman and Russell Sachs and Zuckerman and Feigl also. And if you're interested, you can see Gil Kalai's blog, which is what I'm relying on. Oh, yeah? OK, so yeah, I'm just. Here's the best result. Really? Yeah. I thought these are tight. Well, oh, wait. One thing I need to say is um, they introduced the notion of influence of a variable in this paper which is why the paper's so influential. So it's kind of, that's why it's interesting. Sorry. So you're saying that, um, I mean, as far as I know, log star rounds. OK, multiple rounds means that you look at the array, and then you do it again. You create another array synchronously. And you're saying, so they have a tight, there is, oh, so maybe there so is. The number of, you are trying to minimize number of rounds. Oh, yeah, okay. And what's Moni trying to? Oh, 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 okay. Okay, so they're able to tolerate a constant fraction, and they can do it in log star in rounds. And, um, you know, Feige's algorithm is so cute that I actually don't know, <laughs> never bothered to learn the other algorithm, but it's also cute, I think. Wait, so what happens is you can look at the array and say, well, I don't, I don't like this round, let's do another one? No, no, you run in log star in rounds. I'll show you the algorithm. The goal is to pick a leader, and then the leader can flip a coin. So I'm just asking, what is this problem? Uh, so this is called, so here they're trying to elect a good leader. OK, so they're actually trying to do a coin flip too, but their way of doing it is to elect a good leader who flips a coin. You don't have to say, I don't like it. You don't have to say, I don't like it. You just, <laughs> you read it, and then you do it again. Yeah, it's a round. It's, you know, it's like you get a certain number of rounds. I'll show you the algorithms, really. I can show it in one slide, so. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So if you can <laughs> elect a leader. Now, OK, so there's a problem with electing a leader, which is that, um, you can only do that. It's only possible to elect a leader with a probability that's no more than the fraction of good guys, because even because a bad guy could pretend to be a good guy, and you wouldn't know that it would be the same. And so you can never beat the um, you know one fifth probability of picking a bad guy who tosses a bad coin. You could ask to get a coin flip with high probability. So there is a sort of difference in the problem. Now, but there there is. Um, uh, so if you elect a leader, you can get a coin flip with a, some probability. Um, if you can generate a random number, you can also pick. If you can generate a random coin flip, you can also pick a leader. So they're certainly related. Um, and there's an interesting lower bound proof of a log star. Uh, so this has a lower bound proof. And then there's a, another one which is sort of tighter. 
depending on the resilience in Feige's paper. Resilience is the size of t, the number of bad guys. OK, here's Feige's algorithm just for the fun of it. So you have um, some number of bins. And um, that's how to conceive of it. And everybody randomly picks. The goal is to uh, re reduce. So every processor is viewed as a candidate for the leader. And the goal is to reduce the number of candidates at each stage. So every processor randomly picks a bin, writes down the bin number. And um, the bin with the fewest, picked by the fewest candidates, wins. What does it mean? It wins. The candidates in that bin become the next uh, possible candidates. OK, and this way you could really eliminate a lot of candidates, depending on how, how many bins you have. OK, so, um, and what's wonderful about this is that it, it, it permits a rushing adversary, meaning that the bad guys can see all the bits and then pick any bin it likes. But what, what can the bad guys do? The good guys have sort of randomly distributed themselves across the bins. If the bad guys pick some bin, target a bin, then they're just going to weight it too much. So there's nothing they can do other than sort of evenly distribute themselves out. And that's why the fraction of bad guys promoted to the next round is relatively the same as it was before. OK, so it's really clever and very simple to describe, and it's really fun. Well, but you see, it's because the model, the model is really simple, too. No, no, even for this model. Oh, 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 the stuff. So I don't know Russell Zuckerman's one. I think, is that also, it didn't seem like it would be that hard, but I don't know. But this one's really simple. This is one you tell, you can tell anyone. OK, so I told my kids. Um, OK, so now how do you go from the broadcast model to real models that are used for distributed computing so that you can actually solve the Byzantine agreement problem? OK, so broadcast is kind of like the synchronous model, but not quite. Because um, in the synchronous model, bad processes can send a different message to different people. Uh, and we, as I said, there's a lower bound of t plus 1 for the deterministic synchronous computing of Byzantine agreement versus the one round trivial solution in the broadcast model. OK, so what I, my talk is probably going at a slower pace than I anticipated, but I have these goals. I thought I would never get to this one, so I probably won't. I want to figure out for you what the right model is for distributed coin tossing. Uh, in the back of my mind, so I was at the Simons Institute last semester with Nazi Lineal and Gil Kalai, and all I could think of is what can I tell them so they would look at this problem <laughs> because they're not going to real. They haven't. They have yet to look at it in the real in a model that really will have, have an impact for distributed computing. How can I get them to look at the right problem? And, um, and also, um, and then I'll try to describe my result. OK, so what I'm going to do is show the first improvement, really, of Benoit's algorithm. So it's bringing it from expected time to um, polynomial time. Synchronous, there's a t plus 1. t yeah. plus 1. I said that right here. Uh, that's a lower bound. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I forgot to say. It's a lower and upper bound. Right. You're right. OK, so um, however, I don't get, I, I don't know how to get n over 3. I just have, I don't know, n over 500. I mean, I know it's not optimal. I haven't optimized my own algorithm. OK, so. Now, what I had hoped to do, how are we doing? It's 11.17, so I've been talking for almost an hour. OK, what I'd hoped to do is to talk about some nice ideas in the static case. So if the, if, the, if the adversary is static, meaning that it has to pick its locations at the start, it's a very different problem. Because you can essentially do some kind of leader election. And, um, And if even to get high probability, you can elect a set of, of leaders. And uh, so there's different things you can do if the, algorithm, if the adversary is static. And my first work in this field was dealing with a static adversary. OK, so that, that means that the adversary is not picking the guys to corrupt. It's picking all the guys to corrupt at the start. And, um, and in fact, you can reduce the running time down to, uh, poly lo to log n in the synchronous case and poly log n in the asynchronous case. Yeah. 
situation right now for solving the problem you want to solve, uh, that the number of rounds is an issue at all. So you, 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 you talked about leader election algorithms which lead to coin flipping algorithms, right. which run very fast in terms of the number of rounds. Right. But this is not of the essence for what we are trying to do. Well. I, I don't know. Well. Well, so is it? Well, it doesn't give the result, but it's close to it. I mean, it, it gives you, uh, okay. Why, why is the number of rounds critical? Suppose uh, you, you have your uh, coin flipping algorithm which took n to the 10 rounds, but uh, gave you a, a good coin flip. Then I would plug it into Ben Orr's algorithm. Exactly. So why, why, why are you picky on, you know, doing something with a log Oh, 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 because this is, uh, because this was never known before. It was never known that in the static, no one ever. So that's just a solution to a different problem that may help you or may not. Uh, well, OK, well, oh, oh. Another parameter, which is not, uh, which is not interesting to you. Not, no, it's very interesting to me. It's <laughs> not interesting to the goal you, uh, it's not clear to me how interesting it is to the far, to the goal you want to achieve at the end. Um, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's just a, a OK, so, so it's, this is the goal of the talk, right? I just thought I would show you some interesting things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not necessarily everything related to asynchronous. Okay, So there is no relationship. In fact, they're very different problems. Dealing with a static adversary seems to be very different from dealing with an adversary that has to decide on locations on the fly. However, I just thought it was interesting. And while I had two hours of your time, I thought I would show you something. But um, So that, that's the only reason for talking about it. Um, it it's basically an adaptation of FIGA's algorithm. And so it's kind of cool, and it's kind of neat. And what we do, and we can make it asynchronous. So we can make it asynchronous, even with a static adversary. And there's some interesting techniques. But I won't have time to describe them. I just say briefly, maybe I'll just show briefly. So what you do is you sort of break, um, you break the, um, the set of processors into small committees. And then, um, and then you. Um, I guess most people here would know what an averaging sampler is. It's a way to um, associate subsets, to create subsets of, of, of elements so that most subsets have a majority or have a, have a fraction of, of good guys, which is similar to the fraction of good guys in the, in the base, in the, in the uh, original set. And then there's some bad sets, subsets. OK, so using those, we. Um, we create a sort of structure where we're electing people using FIGA's algorithm. They're going to the top. We're mapping them again to subsets, to committees. They're running FIGA elections, and so on, until we have a small set at the top. The committees are running the, the, committees are running the elections because they're small enough that we can do things fast. We can take a known Byzantine agreement algorithm and use it to pick to run FIGA's algorithm, because we don't have broadcast. We have to use Byzantine agreement to get the equivalent of broadcast, to simulate broadcast. And in the asynchronous model, it becomes very complicated. It, 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 it's tricky. In the asynchronous model, it's tricky to run FIGA's algorithm. Uh, maybe I'll say two words about why it's tricky. It's really interesting. I think the asynchronous one is really interesting. What? Well, it's log n for synchronous, because we know we have a linear time algorithm to do synchronous agreement. And for the asynchronous case, in those days when I developed it, we had nothing better than um, exponential time. So we, the groups had log log n. Uh, not quite. We do it sort of recursively, but they end up having log log n. OK, so um, this. Lot, there's these two things that go wrong with FIGA's algorithm when we're implementing it in the asynchronous. Um, and, and maybe I'll just describe them, and then I'm going to abandon this so, so as to whet your curiosity. The two things that go wrong in the FIGA's algorithm are that uh, you have to, you can't wait to hear from everybody. So in fact, you only get bin choices from a small fraction of good processors. Mostly, you're going to hear from bad processors. How bad is that? It sounds bad, but actually that one was easily um, that one was easily um, cured. The second pro well, it wasn't easily cured. It took us a long time to figure it out, but then it turns out that Zuckerman had a result that we could have used uh, 
like the past year that had appeared in crypto that gave the solution. But we figured it out independently, so it was, kind of, it was a struggle for us. OK. The second problem was that the bad guys, oh, so this is the, sorry, this is the first problem. Oh, no. No. Sorry. Wait a second there. No, actually, I, something's wrong with my slides. Uh, uh, this is, all right, sorry. The second problem is not here. I'm missing, oh. This, the first problem was the problem of we had to construct that, um, that structure. OK, I'll just tell you the, the other problem. The other problem is that if the adversary wants to, he could just delay all the guys have pick, which have picked bin 1. And then all the bad guys jump into bin 1. So then he has a bin, you know, just the right number of bad guys jump, jump into bin 1 so that they're the minimum bin. And those guys become the winners. So that's the that's a hard that was also took us time to figure out how to get around. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about this stuff. Um, and I guess we could take a break, right? It's time to take a break, maybe. Okay, so is it 11:24 then? Okay, so I will uh, I'll we'll stop here, and then we'll go on to my. Um, um, uh, hopefully, we'll go on to finishing the uh, the real the asynchronous Byzantine agreement problem. All right, break. You're going to see the first presentation that I've ever made <laughs> of this model for distributed algorithm design. Okay, it's new. I just developed it. I've been trying. I've been thinking about it all year since I talked to Nazi and Gil at uh, the Simons Institute. What could I say to them that would possibly cause them to work on this problem? And uh, I don't know. I mean, it could be wrong. I mean, it seems right to me, but who knows? OK, so um, so just to tell you, so what I'm going to do is develop a model for you, which you could use to design algorithms. It, uh, and obviously, and, and any lower bound in the real model will work for this, because it can be implemented in the real model. But it, it may not be tight. There may be. Um, it may be that you could do better outside this model, right? There might be. Um, uh, all right. So there's two things that inspired the model. One is reliable broadcast. So this is something invented oh, right after, like in the mid 80s. Um, so, and it's a, it's, it's a simple routine. And if you look at it, it's very similar to something from Ben Orr's algorithm. And what it says, if you follow this routine, um, so when you're sending out a message, you, you broadcast it using this routine, reliable broadcast, then, uh, and everyone follows this. If a message is received, officially received, if you reach this stage where you receive a message, then any time if a, a message is received by a good processor, then it will eventually be received by every other process, every other processor, and no other message. Um, no, it won't be mistaken for any other message by any good processor. So that's the benefit of this simple routine. So how does it work? There is something else like you did besides the But then you did not say what it does. I mean, even though it looks similar, it seems like it has another type of method which is ready. Well, ready is when you get, ready is like when you were deciding. So no, oh, it's quite different. It's, it, there's two stages. You send ready either when you've gotten a lot of the echo messages. Echo, oh, so first, somebody sends out a message. Everybody echoes it. Oh, it's a situation where only one guy. Yes, yes, one, one, person, one person, person is sending. Is yeah, it's different. But it sort of looks yeah, like it. It's got, it's got similar reasons for working. No, you know something, I haven't even like, I've tried to, I haven't even thought about great, I'm just sort of using it as a subroutine. And it's, you know, it's kind of looks, I mean, I have, I don't know. I haven't proven it to myself, but anyhow. So it's, um, I mean, I did look at it because I thought maybe it would give something in terms of synchronous agreement, but it doesn't. It doesn't seem to. OK, so. So one person sends a message. Everybody that receives it sends the, echo and. Uh, echoes it. it. And then and if then you get, uh, if you get a certain number of echoes that agree on a value, then you send ready. Or if you get a certain number of smaller number of readies, then you've received it. 
And then if you receive a certain number of ready messages, you receive it officially. OK, so that's. If it's yeah, suppose, suppose this is used as a subroutine. It, so Baraka, OK, this was developed by Braca to improve the result of Benoit from resilience of n over, three, n over 5 to resilience of n over 3. This is one of the subroutines that he uses in that, in that protocol. So this is, instead of sending your message, you always broadcast. You use this. You reliably broadcast your message. Right, but the question is, so presumably yeah. you're receiving a lot of different messages. Yeah. No, this particular, no, OK. If you know who you're getting a message from, right? You know, so it's got a name, um, like George, George's message. So George's message will never be mistaken in value. George's fifth message will never be mistaken in value. But there's more to it. He also has another thing called verifiable broadcasting, which means you could have sent. It. So he's got a couple of uh, sort of constant time routines that have desirable properties that, that improve the resilience of Benoit's algorithm. OK, so what are the consequences? Uh, so if somebody sends a message, then either it will eventually become known. If a good guy sends it, it will become known. Oh, I'm back to thinking about this array. If, if a processor I, J sends a message, either it will be received or, I mean, it becomes known to all good processes eventually. That doesn't mean we, there's no way to measure time. But eventually, its messages are delivered, and they go through this protocol, and um, it's received. Otherwise, if it's a bad guy sending a message, well, he may not send it. Or it may never be received. But if it's received by two good processors, they won't receive two different values for the same message. OK, so that's the consequence of this thing. OK, so then Benoit put another layer on top of this, um, also in the 80s. He calls it multicast. Now, now he has not one processor sending a message, but he has, it's not just Benoit. There's another, Ron Elianev, I think, is the other process, person who co-authored it. Anyhow, I shouldn't say just one person. Anyhow, he has now everybody sending a message. Now, if everyone sends a message, it's possible that if you were just using reliable broadcast, it could be that, um, so you can't wait to hear from everybody. So it could be that some processor will receive um, some set of sub, a subset of messages from some other processors, and some other process will receive a, su a different subset of messages uh, from other processors. But using this multicast, we can ensure that when a good processor finishes this multicast protocol, n minus 2t processors know the same set of n minus t values. OK, I'm just telling you these results be so as to inspire the model I'm going to show you. And I'm not even going to show you how I implement the model, because it's boring. And it's boring to look at all these things. I know it's boring. So you yeah. say value, you mean of, so the n cost of each sent a message. OK. Right, exactly. The same set, the same set. So you could, they'll see an array, and they'll have, and it will be filled. N minus t locations, the same n minus t locations will be filled for everybody, and with the same values. All right. So I'm going to show you this model. I hope it's right. <laughs> um, so. Um, the known algorithms that I, that I know of do about the same as they would do in this model, uh, subject to log n factors, log n, log n, less than log n factors. OK, so here is the description of this model. We're going to see a sequence of matrices. Um, and uh, there'll be m by n matrices. m will be specified by the algorithm. Uh, I'll tell you that. Oh, yeah, OK. And now each matrix is going to be filled top down with random bits. All right, I know that sounds ambiguous. Give me a second. OK, so each one, one is going to be filled up, and then 
there's going to be, and then something's going to happen. Then the algorithm's going to do something. Then another one's going to be filled up, and then the algorithm's going to do something. OK, so before the algorithm sees the matrix, the adversary is going to alter the matrix in two possible ways. It's going to, uh, let's start with number two first. It's going to, uh, so I said they're being filled top down in any order. I don't know the order. The adversary can determine the order, but top down. So in other words, this value will be filled in before this value. The adversary can stop, stop any column, when it, uh, up to t columns when it wants. OK, so say it chooses this column to stop and this column to stop. That's the first type now. For the ones that it, it's also going to be able to alter, after it sees all the uh, values, it's going to be able to alter up to t columns of them. However, once it picks those, it doesn't have to pick the t columns right away with the first matrix. It could pick one for the first matrix, another one for the second matrix. But once it picks t columns, it can't change. Once a column is picked, it stays picked for the rest of the string. OK, however, these, there are t places where it can stop, and the places where it stops can vary by matrix. OK, now what does it mean when it stops it? It means that the algorithm only, it gets to specify a subset of the values in the stopped rows of the stopped columns for the algorithm to see. OK, now here's what we want. Oh, I did tell you. One is the is is the one is the stuff, and this is two. Okay. Now this is the problem statement. So I'm going to describe a problem statement for the global coin flip. This is the kind of global coin flip we need for Benoit's algorithm. Okay. So what we need to do is specify an f, which is a family of functions f1, f2, where f k is a function of k of the first k m m by n mat uh, matrices. OK, we're going to, the uh, f gets to choose m and design f, so when we want to design f, so as to minimize uh, this variable max so that, OK, here goes, I hope this is right, for any n minus t sequences created by the adversary. OK, so the adversary will take each matrix and alter it in the ways that I described. So there will be, the adversary can make um, n minus t streams by altering the matrix in the way that I described. In other words, um, this stuff has to be the same. What it can alter is the subset of this. Now this can overlap this. this these, these columns can overlap these columns. I mean, it could be, they could be the same, but they could also be different. OK, the adversary can pick a subset, a different subset for each stream. OK? A stream. So there will be this stream is the same thing. Sorry, I'm using stream to mean sequence of matrices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. So, yeah. OK, so there's two things the adversary can do. So first, so it can take M, each matrix, one at a time online, and it can alter any values in the selected columns, its selected columns. They will be the same for each, each stream, each, each of the N minus T sequences, the altered sequences. Sorry? Yes, the adversary, the, okay. Let me, let me go through this and then come back. Okay, so the goal is to get these, design these functions. Each function takes a stream, a sequence of matrices as uh, a longer and longer sequence of matrices as its input. You want, the, you want that for a large enough fraction of these streams. Yeah. Yeah. Matrices. Yeah, OK, so. How many, how many matrices are there? OK. There's going to be a sequence of matrices. 
the adversary gets to alter them. So this one, this like you start with these, this, this M. There's going to be a sequence of these Ms. Now the adversary, but one at a time, the adversary is going to alter them and make copies, but they're modified copies. How uh, many of them? N minus T of them. Both. One for each processor. N minus T of them, where some subset of these are missing. OK. And then there's going to be another matrix. And the adversary gets to, can't vary the ones it's chosen already, but it gets to modify a different subset of, do the same thing here, and create the next one in, in the sequence for each of these. Yes. Oh, no. It has to stop. That's why they're filled top down. It can't see the rest oh, of the. It gets, it gets to stop it before the rest of the column is generated. N minus T what? It gets to stop this thing. The, the stopping point is the same for everybody. The difference is what subset of these are revealed. So all it gets to do in determining the alterations is to pick a subset of these that will appear, a subset of the last entries. I don't think it's mentioned that the last entry has been determined to decide not to. It gets to, oh, sorry, it gets to decide which, for a subset of these last entries, it gets to blank it out. Sorry, I didn't say that. It gets to exclude the values of the last entries, these underlined entries. In the following sequences, it can decide which of these, it can make this a blank. And, there, and, that's how, and has n minus t uh, ways to do that. OK, that's how it generates. So it's going to generate n minus t sequences this way. They're all going to be almost all alike, except for the choice of these subset, the subset of entries in the last rows here, which are blanked out. OK? And that has to be decided before seeing these. There are no random bits that come after this. So what if in another copy of the same matrix, I make a different choice? Then I do see the value shift. Yeah. So in other words, so this processor <laughs> down here might see 0, 1. And this pro another processor down here might not see the 0, 1. It sees, OK, so what does it see? It sees, it has to call stop before seeing, there's no more bits here. It has to call stop and tell them to stop. And it sees these values. But let's say I didn't call stop for, for this matrix, the one below it. I already know everything from the one above, right? No, no. You call stop for M, the, 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 the template matrix. OK, you call stop. There's a, there's a matrix M. Now, this isn't good enough for Nati and, and Gil, I can tell. OK, sorry. So there's a template matrix, OK? And now the adversary has to call stop in the template matrix. And then from, the and then from the template, it gener yeah, now it's, it's, it's called stop. And now it generates the other sequences, the other. And they, all, they will only differ by the, but the subset. That's it. But in all the bottom ones, the same T or whatever of the column will be. The same, uh, unless they're, unless unless they're, they're stopped. The pink, the pink. Yeah, I'm saying the pink could be subject, could be, these could be overlapping sets. Okay, yeah. The pink part will be the same in all. Unless, unless some of these columns have been yeah, are exactly among the T. Yeah. yeah. Right. So. The only thing that's different uh, is the subset of these selected to be stopped. OK. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. So you select these after you've seen the whole matrix. You select, you can do the selection of these columns after you've seen the matrix, after you've called stop and you've seen the whole matrix. Yeah, and it doesn't even have to be, the rows don't have to be revealed one by one. They just have to be filled up top to bottom. It doesn't have to be that this row appears after this row. Just that this appears after this. So if the columns are messages of processors, right? But the adversary then also gets to choose the order in which things are revealed as long as it's top to bottom. If yeah. it doesn't want to. Right. So it could be that this one will go all the way down and this one will be stopped up here. 
Okay, so that's the model. I hope it's okay. Does anyone still have a question about it? So, yeah. Yeah, if you want, you can think of them as having an empty symbol in them. I just couldn't figure out how to make a turnstile symbol. I mean, a lot of my presentation has limited my, my inabilities on PowerPoint. And, uh, yeah. What other modifications do you do? So the only modification, so you take this, you can, now you change this, this is the template, and now you're able to modify the others just by excluding some of the, some of the underlying symbols. A subset of the underlying symbols. All right. All right. So what do you want to do? Now the goal is to create a function so that with constant probability, the, you want a k such that with constant probability, the outcome of all this of f on any of the sequences will be equal on all the sequences will be equal, or not, uh, sorry, not all of them, four-fifths of them will be equal. And you want, even if you knew the values of the first k minus 1 matrices, that the adversary has full knowledge of those matrices, the probability that f is 1 is still bounded between 0 and 1. So it's a fair coin, a relatively fair coin. So you want 1k to have that property, somewhere between a less than max. I don't know if I wrote it right, but that's, that's what I need to have. I want Benoit's algorithm. It's motivated by Benoit's algorithm. I want there to be random bits generated at each step. They may not be collectively agreed upon, but sometime, somewhere, I want enough processes to agree on a bit, and the adversary doesn't know what's coming. Even if it knew everything that came before, it doesn't know what's coming. That's what I need. That's what I want. OK, so I'm trying to formalize this. And then your communication time for the asynchronous Byzantine agreement is m times max. So the number of rows in the matrix times the maximum. OK. Now, for fun, if you want to actually look at this, you might just consider two sequences and see if you can do it. I don't know that there'd be an easy way to do it for two sequences. It's any easier than what I figured out. OK, so, um, but the explanation is smaller, shorter. So I'm just going to show you for two sequences how to get this done. OK. All right. Now I just want to point out that you can think of all the other models in this context, I hope. It looks right to me. OK. so. For example, suppose you want to talk about synchronous Byzantine adaptive rushing. Okay. Then you just cross out any t columns here from point number two, and you say you can only stop from among the selected t columns. Okay, so I'm, I'm claiming that this model captures all the other models. Um, okay, so, um, so that means that each stage, the ones you're stopping have to only be from a small set, the t set. They can't be scattered around the matrix, as I showed you before. That's the synchronous Byzantine adaptive rushing um, adversary. Can I make it simpler? So when, when it's asynchronous, the adversary, so this captured matrix, it has the ability to think at an element and say, reveal this element to my element. And for this one, the rows do have to be revealed row by row, right? Because it's synchronous. So every number that's stopped has to be stopped at that row. Because there's a no, no. There's another element which doesn't appear in this formulation, which is when does the adversary see which entries of the matrix? Yeah, but you see, wait, okay. It has more power in the asynchronous. Version. Okay, so sorry. So you're saying this doesn't capture synchronous because? I'm just saying there's another element to this formulation, which is the adversary needs to say when does it get to see which parts of the matrix in order to make right. a so I'm allowing them to see the whole thing, right? No. Except the end, the end. But you said that the, uh, I'm allow, the adversary can see everything except there is nothing that comes after here, right? If, for example, it only decides to stop a column, yeah. what does it know about the other columns? It sees everything. Oh, you're saying, 
uh, it can it can regulate the delivery of these columns. Well, I'm saying the increase in dispersion, its ability to regulate is more. It can look at any entry and say, tell me what's the value of this entry. Uh, are you saying this isn't? You're saying that I'm being too that the synchronous is not that synchronous is actually more powerful than this. The adversary is weaker. The adversary is weaker here. Uh, stronger, you mean? Stronger. Wait, for synchronous or asynchronous? Oh, really? What do you think is missing for synchronous? Right. It can. So I'm making the adversary stronger here, right? I'm trying to make the adversary stronger. Okay, that's what you're saying. I'm making the adversary stronger, because, and I'm saying if I can design in this case, I'll have an algorithm for. Yeah. Okay. What I'm trying to do is possibly make the adversary stronger. Okay. Now, the question is. So again, I'm saying that I'm sort of capturing synchronous, but you're, you're making an argument that, um, that, it's, that the adversary is too strong. And I would say that, well, but the algorithms that we know for synchronous fit into this. I, I would say that they don't, because they rely on it being synchronous. Yeah, but you know what? They use m equal to 1. That's what the algorithms do in the synchronous case. Most algorithms use m equal to 1. Almost all algorithms I know of use m equal to 1, except for something else, which I'll get to. OK, so in that case, yes, you see everything. The adversary sees everything. OK, so, um, uh, so I was just saying, the synchronous case is interesting. It's still open, very open, if you ask me. OK. Now, another possibility is the crash-fail model. In the crash-fail model, you get rid of this part. The adversary can't write anything it wants. All it can do is prevent, um, it can prevent, it can stop only from among the selected t columns. It can stop them, and some of those values will be seen, and some of them won't be. OK, so, um, so in that particular case, it's not hard to see that there's a t over 2 square root m, something like this, algorithm where m equals 1. And that would feed into to Ben Orr's Ben Orr's original algorithm. You would just um, either the adversary crashes square root n guys, in which case he can he affects things with a constant probability, or he doesn't. If he doesn't crash square root n, then you're likely to come to agreement. So he can only crash square root n square root n times. So this gives a sort of square root n bound. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, F would be the majority. F takes the majority. Yeah, yeah. So okay. What's the algorithm? The algorithm what is. What's the process of so where okay. Who feels which uh, uh, yeah. You run this algorithm the way I described. The matrices fill up with random bits. M is equal to one. So I'm doing a. Okay. So we have a basic. This is to do a collective coin flip, right? right? So it's specified. They're filled up with random bits. This is just to do a collective coin flip in the. Yeah. Yeah. So we wanted to say, and uh, yeah. we just did this, that every fourth cell stands randomly. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I don't want to say that because I'm in this model I've defined where so who generates the, random bits? the mo it goes back to how I define the model. Oh, the uh, array fills up with random bits. So, so in other words, I'm just trying to, I've defined a very narrow model for collective coin flipping. <laughs> There's no, there's no bits. There's no input bits, right? So there's just random bits. The, ra the random bits, you, you want a, a coin flip which will be with which function? Yeah. So all I need to do, which I didn't say, is define what f is. So f takes the majority of all the non-empty entries. So f1 takes the majority in the first array. f2 takes the majority in, I should have said, of the second array, the and so on. Second array, and F three takes the majority of the third array, and that's the al that's the algorithm. And the array only has one. I mean, the array is just one row, right? And so either the adversary is killing off square root n guys, or it's not. If it's not, then there's a constant probability that you'll have a coin flip. Everybody, will, um, all the sequences will be the, will will have more than um, 
a variant will have like more than square root n ones versus zeros, say. Or he'll, he can do this for like square root n times. Now that's not tight because actually you can get an additional square root log n factor. Um, and you can also, he has a tight lower bound. And that's because he goes and modifies the Byzantine agreement protocol that he's using. So I'm not going to get into that. But We're talking about collective coin flip. What's the original alg algorithm for collective? Oh, you mean Ben Orr's algorithm. Yeah. So this is not about doing Byzantine agreement. This is about getting a collective coin flip. I'm just, I've switched the problem to getting a collective coin flip. And we all are convinced that if we have a collective coin flip, it would work. And the time that's proportional to the time to get a collective coin flip. So I, I'm not, I mean, yes, you can switch, you can play with that to do better, but I'm not going to try. Okay. Now, suppose you have a static asynchronous algorithm. Then you select the columns at the start of the sequence. The T columns are selected at the very start. And that would be it. That would be the difference. All right. Uh, now there's asynchronous crash, crash faults. Okay. In that case, um, did I say this one already? So in that case, yeah, I talked about crash faults. So it would just be asynchronous. Um, right. The difference, the difference is that the, the um, subset of values that you can pick are still any subset. It doesn't have to be the original. It doesn't have to be restricted to the T. In the synchronous, it's restricted to the T columns. Here, it can go, it can vary over any columns. The T that you pick, th that you stop, can, are not restricted to the um, original T or to any particular T. All right, now there is an algorithm, and this, uh, this problem is pretty well understood, asynchronous, uh, oh, it should be called crash faults. You take the majority function, and um, what can you do? So in an n by n matrix, you pick n, m to be n. You take the majority function. And the, you can only, the adversary can only um, delete or differ, make the streams differ by only t different coin flips. So you probably have a variance of n. And so with constant probability, you'll get a random coin flip. So that, and there is a lower bound of t squared for global coin flip in the shared memory model. So nobody's looking at this model that I created, of course. But there's something called the shared memory model, which they're using. The reason I'm not using shared memory model is that I, don't th I never found a description of it. I don't see a definition for it for Byzantine failures. So I had to sort of invent my own thing. That's why I'm inventing my own model. Um, and there is a lower bound for Byzantine agreement, also by Jim, for randomized Byzantine agreement. On the num this is the number of random bits. Needed. Yeah. Uh, of course, of this uh, algorithm, this stuff we have done, is it the, uh, if you have just crash case, yeah. then you can do in a special polynomial time uh, when it works. You just do this thing. You just get a global coin, you generate a global coin flip. Yeah, and therefore you can do it on the. No, I mean, not therefore. They're doing it in the shared memory, so they worry about, I mean, there's, oh, they had okay. to construct how you read them. I mean, they didn't use my, they didn't use my, framework, so they have constructed their own framework. Yeah, exactly. yeah, right, which I feel I've implemented, but all right, anyhow. But I had to implement in shared memory, uh, in message passing, and they were implementing it in shared memory, which is simpler, <laughs> I guess. Okay, so what do we have? Ah, so restrictions on F, which brings up the work of Luco and Luco, and I, I'm not sure these dates are quite right. And Alice and Luco, Alice and Luco is actually the first one. And Luco and Luco is the second one. And I don't have the exact statement. This one is F has to be symmetric. It can't depend on the index of the columns. And that, that implies exponential cost. And Luco and Luco, oh, some spelling. F of K has limited memory. So it can't rely on the whole stream, the whole sequence. But how it's limited, I don't have an exact description because it doesn't fit in with my model. So I'd have to translate it into my model. 
And that also requires exponential cost. All right, so where are we? Here we are, and I don't have, I have only a half, I can't believe I only have 25 minutes, so I'm sorry. All right, but we've come part of the way. So we're going to do asynchronous adaptive. And all we care about right now is generating a global coin in this weird model of computation that I invented. And I have this background. I've gone through a lot of it. Um, there's the posing of the original question. There's the impossibility result. There's Ben Orr's result. There's Broca's improvement of resilience to N over 3. There's private channels in cryptography, Feldman and Macaulay. There's um, optimal res improved to optimal resilience in 1993, which is N over 3. There's um, shared memory with crash failures. That's Asnes and a bunch of other people. And then improved to N squared by um, Spencer and Hillel. They show that n squared work is, is required, but that's not the same thing as random bits. Um, then, what's that? Wait, say that again. Oh, sensor Hillel is one person. Sensor Hillel and Atiyah. OK, so or Atiyah and sensor Hillel. All right, so then, um, so then there's also this. Um, uh, there's the idea of the static, oh, did I say adaptive? That shouldn't say adaptive. There's a static adversary who chooses the bad processes as its start. That gives a polylog time algorithm. Okay, polylog time, if you can, if you pick that at the start. And uh, in the synchronous model, log n. Um, and then there's, um, there's the Luca Luca results, which I already talked about. That's about all there is in this, in the, this model, like so, the, well, there isn't a lot of literature. All right, so um, all right, so remember what the model is, I know, and we're going to just try to get the toy problem with two streams, just to make it simpler. It's really not hard to put in all the other streams; it's just another level of something I can't, I don't have time to talk about. Okay, so I, all I need to do is define for you an f, and I'm going to let m equal n. All right, so. F is going to be, when you see uh, the matrix, you're going to take the sum of all the values in the matrix and take the majority. So I'm going to think of the, um, the coin flips as being plus or minus 1. And you take the sign of the sum. However, you're only going to restrict consideration to certain columns. You're going to eliminate columns. H is going to be the columns you're still maintaining. So you're basically, the idea is to remove columns that you think are bad are generated by bad processes. OK, so I'm going to be generating um, another matrix. And the entries of the other matrix are going to be the sums of each of the columns. So um, every n steps, every n matrices, I'm going to generate a matrix A. The, the algorithm is going to generate a matrix A, where the ith row of matrix A is going to be the, the sum of the columns in the ith in the past, in the ith mod, whatever, the past, the ith. So in the period before that matrix, there are n matrices, you're going to take the ith one, and that's going to be, that's going to determine the ith row of this matrix. And uh, it's just going to be the sum of the columns. So the first entry will be the sum of the first columns, and the second one the sum, the sum of the second column. That's going to determine your A matrix. So it's an integer matrix. Yeah, it's an integer matrix, positive and negative integers ranging from, well, possibly minus n to plus n. OK, and so H0 is going to contain all the columns to start, and uh, gradually it's going to be reduced. Now, it's going to be, if you're not, if n doesn't divide k, if you're not at the end of a period of seeing n, you're going to divide the stream into n, into chunks of size n. If you're not at the end of a chunk, then you're going to inherit the h from the previous um, the previous matrix, except we're going to remove any columns whose sums are really unbelievably high. Like they exceed what we would expect in variance with high probability. OK. So the only question then is how to determine the H's. So uh, I just described how we define the A's, so I don't really have to say this anymore. Just realize that. And A can't, that these numbers don't vary from the original. If you, if you took M to be your template, 
that these A's are not off by much. They can only be off by one value because they're possibly missing one of these. That's it. So the and, only T of them can be off by one value. Otherwise, they're the same as the template. Okay. All right, so the, the goal is to detect bad bias. Now, what's bad bias? It's the sum, it's the absolute value of the sum of the entries changed by the adversary that we're still considering, that are still in H. Okay, so, and so that would depend on, that could depend on the stream, the sequence, the stream that you're in, because the adversary could arrange that the, that the H's are different. Because there's an absolute threshold for determining these H's. And by varying things by one, the adversary can actually change which, what the con, the di there could be different H's for, different for the two different sequences. The good bias is the sum of the entries in the unselected columns. OK, so I'm just now focusing on one row, which corresponds to one, matri one matrix M okay, in the sequence. So this is one row of A. And these are the, um, the total of the coin tosses by each, thinking of it, each processor. OK, so good bias is, is determined by, um, by M, the original coins that are in the template matrix. All right, now one thing we observe is that there's a lot of randomness. There's a lot of M is going to have a Every sequence, M, is going to have a lot of, of randomness. There's going to be all but some missing stuff in T columns, and T could be pretty small. We're allowed, we're on N over 500. And the stuff that the bad guy took over. Everything else is random. So we have a lot of random entries. But we're missing any, any good columns that were thrown, in, thrown out of H. So if we threw a lot of good columns out of H, we're missing their randomness because we're not even using it. Okay, that won't, those won't be reflected in the, in the. Um, well, here we're not counting that, but we will later on be when we take the when we look at M prime, we won't be counting that randomness. All right, so. So, we want that. F applied to M prime, if M prime is one of the matrices in one sequence and M double prime is the corresponding matrix in the other sequence, we want that F will give the same value and we want that it will be a fair coin. Okay, and it will be fair if the bad bias is too small. If the bad bias is smaller than the good bias minus the, one, minus the values that were excluded by the adversary, minus the value of the fair coins that were not in the columns that are no longer in consideration, then, and that's true for both streams, if that's true for both streams, then they will agree on a value, and that value will be determined by the good bias, by the random coin flips. Okay, so how bad is the bad bias? Uh, well, we have, you know, just using standard kind of bounds on flipping coins, we know you're gonna get square root n bias with some constant probability. So we let alpha be um, square root of roughly a little bit around square root of the number of fair coins that we expect. And we're going to see 1 over 20 probability that we'll have that kind of bias. And, uh, and we're allowed to make t pretty small, like n over 500. And assuming that, these, that we haven't taken out too many good columns from h, then, and in fact, no more than t plus 1 columns, then we can show that the value of the fit with you know some probability, high prob some reasonable probability, the value of the fair coins that are excluded is not too high. So that still leaves us with um, the bad bias. So with some probability that the excluded coins don't have too high a value, we we have that f of k. F, F sub k, the, the function on the kth matrix, has a value that's determined by the random bits of mk, or the bad bias is high. And it has to exceed this amount, 2n over 3. All right, so um,
if the fk is, does not have its value determined by the rent, if this doesn't happen, then, so this is the probability it doesn't happen for some row, but if this doesn't happen for all the rows, for all the rows where there's high good bias, then there's got to be m prime, a constant fraction of rows where there's bad bias. Okay. So, and now it, it could be bad bias in one of the streams, or it could be bad bias in the other stream. But somewhere, somehow, there's bad bias. Otherwise, they would have come to agreement. OK, so the goal is to detect the bad columns. Now, why can we detect bad bias? Because it's different from good bias. It's concentrated among a smaller set of columns. So there's a natural good bias produced by columns. And there's an, it's unnatural for you know, n over 500 such columns produce the same amount of bias. So we are going to detect this unnaturally bad bias. So that's the next question. All right. So uh, we're going to use this matrix A to detect the bias. And we stared at this picture for a long time. So you have um, each, you have a, left, a bipartite graph. Each node is, uh, the nodes on the left-hand side are the columns. The nodes on the right-hand side are the rows. And what we know is that there's a small number of columns which are creating a lot of bias. So if you think of these edges as weighted with the bias from each row of A for each matrix, in other words, um, um, this is weighted with the value Aij then um, we're looking for this kind of heavy bipartite graph where these weights are heavy. The sum of the weights coming from these nodes is, is unusually heavy. So that's how I started looking at planted clique. And I started looking at flow problems, trying to solve this problem. And I didn't see, we didn't see how to do it. We spent a few months on this. And then, uh, so the first attempt was in stock. And we just showed that there was an n to the 3 halves algorithm, but we didn't have a polynomial time algorithm for computing f. The second attempt, you know, we knew there was a sort of heavy clique there, but we didn't have to find it. The second attempt is polynomial time, but we increased this. OK, I have 10 minutes. All right, I can show you the algorithm. Uh, just want to just point out, I have a change in notation. A prime. Restricted to H prime is now M, and B is now bad. OK, so I'm going to tr try to find this bad set of columns. And uh, here, it's a very simple algorithm. I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to use two norms of vectors and matrices. And um, I'm going to keep, a, the F is going to keep a score for each column. And when? The threshold is going to be around this value. And um, when the norm of the matrix exceeds a certain threshold, that threshold, then we compute the right singular, top right singular vector of the matrix, and we increase, increase the score of each column by the jth component of that vector squared. And when the bad score gets bigger than 1, we remove the column. And that's it. That's the algorithm. OK. Uh, the approximation algorithm of the planted. The thing is that we didn't have, um, it's not quite the same problem. It's weighted, and we don't have to solve the same problem. It's, it's sort of in flavor. I mean, we were looking at it, but we didn't. It, it, we didn't see how to use it directly. But eventually, it's pretty trivial that this will work. And, uh, but yes, it's sort of like that. Yeah, yeah, same intuition, yeah. OK, so uh, there's a proof. And I don't have much time to go through it, but it's very, once you, see, once you want to prove this, it's not hard to, to prove it. You first show that the ratio, the total badness assigned to good guys over the total badness assigned to bad guys is less than a half. And then you can only remove so many. Uh, you use this lemma, something like this, which shows that the, good, the norm of the good part of the matrix is bounded. You show the norm of the bad part of the matrix is big. 
using what we know about the amount of bias. Um, we demonstrate this here. We demonstrate this vector. When we multiply it times the bad part of the matrix, we know that the, um, each component of the bad part, there's going to be m prime entries, the bad rows. The rows with bad bias are going to have to sum to a lot. That's, that's their definition of being bad. They sum to a lot. When multiplied times here, times that vector, they sum to this much. So we show that the, the norm of the bad matrix is high, and, and that gives it the result. And, um, there's just some computation. And then um, it can't take too long before you've eliminated everybody, the bad guys. And then at that point, you're flipping around. And you're in the consensus mode, and uh, that should work. All right, uh, just stop at open problems. OK, so it's, the resilience is ridiculous. I wonder if you can do it in n over 3 uh, in polynomial time. The running time is like, is, well, it's n squared of these matrices. So no, it's n of these matrices. And each matrix, sorry, it's n squared of these matrices. And each matrix has n cost, n rows, so it's n to the third. Um, is there anything separating Byzantine from consensus? That would be kind of interesting. Um, I guess I don't still don't know the answer to the randomized synchronous. Is this new model always within polylog factor for all these um, all these algorithms, all these problems? Uh, one can talk about message complexity, and in fact, we spent a lot of time doing research on message complexity. Uh, in particular, we did it in all our papers with the static adversary. That was our main concern, actually. That's the only thing we were thinking of was message complexity in that model. And we have a new paper that was just sent into Podsy about consensus in an adaptive adversary trying to cut down the number of bits. Um, finally, um, um, the, this algebra, algebraic topology is used to prove um, hardness results in the deterministic um, in the deterministic model. And um, is there any relationship to randomized algorithms for that? So the, um, the configurations, there's a model where the configurations are points. And um, they build simplicial complices uh, using these points to describe how the algorithm operates. And they get lower bounds that way. 